Hi class, welcome back. I'm Matt Fisher, your accounting professor. This is the second part of the statement of cash flow video. In the first video, we, dis we discussed what the cash flow statement was, and then we also went over the direct method. In this video, we're gonna go over what we call the indirect method. Now, if you remember in the last video, we went over this, we had an operating section, an investing section, and a financing section. Now, if you didn't watch the previous video, you need to go back to that video to, to understand what these three sections are because that's really important. Then when we took the cash flow associated with these three, we had an ending balance or an ending tra cash transactions during the year of a positive 50,000. Our prior year cash balance was 100,000. So then this change of 50,000 plus the prior year cash balance of 100,000 gave us our ending cash balance of 150,000. All right, so this is what you would see on your ending balance sheet for your cash, All right? When we do an indirect cash flow statement, the investing section and the financing section don't change. Whether you use the direct method or the indirect method, they would look exactly the same. They just show the cash transactions plus or minus in the investing sections and then the cash transactions plus or minus, you know, if cash came in, this would increase for, from the financing or this would increase financing. If cash went out for financing, this would decrease the financing section. And the same thing for the investing section. What is different is the operating section. How does the operating section work? Well, indirectly, we're going to show you what's taking place in operations from a cash flow perspective. So what we do for the operating section now for the indirect method is we start with net income. Hopefully you're saying, well, wait a minute, net income's not a cash basis number. That's an accrual basis number. Exactly. That's why we need to then adjust this. So one of the big numbers usually in net income is depreciation, right? Depreciation expense has been subtracted out. All right, so it's been taken out of net income. But let's think about this. Depreciation is not a cash flow number. Remember, when we depreciate a building or depreciate some equipment, are we actually paying money out when we calculate dep that depreciation? No. The cash flow went out when we paid for it or as we paid for it. The depreciation has nothing to do with cash flow. Actually, it's just an accrual basis expense. So since we subtracted it out, we're gonna add back depreciation. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is we want to look at any gains or losses that we have. So if we have any gains or losses on our uh, income statement, then that gain, if it was not a cash transaction type gain, then it's been added in there. We need to subtract that out. And if we had a loss that wasn't cash transaction, then we would need to add that loss back in. Okay. Now, at this point, I realize that this is a little bit tricky, and some students at this point just memorize this, all right, because their, their background in accounting isn't really strong still. But a lot of you understand this well and, and understand what I'm talking about here. Remember, what we're doing is we're looking at the operating activities. So that's why we start with net income, because that's, that's the profit that our business does, right? So we want to add back depreciation, subtract out gains, add back losses, because these aren't really operating activity transactions, right? Gains and losses are kind of the peripheral stuff that the business does. It's not part of their operations. So we subtract out gains, add back losses. Now, the next part is probably the trickiest part, but it's actually, if you think about it, it's really not that bad. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at our current assets, and current liabilities because most of those current assets, most of those current liabilities are operating activity type things, All right? So the first one I wanna take a look at because it kind of illustrates it the best is accounts receivable. So we're looking at a current asset, accounts receivable. This is when uh, our customers owe us money. That's what an account receivable is. They purchase something, but they have not yet paid for it. So our accounts receivable changes. So. At the beginning of the year, let's, let's assume that our accounts receivable was $15,000. At the end of the year, let's assume that our accounts receivable was $17,000, right? So what happened? 
it went up 2,000. Obviously, lots of things took place during the year, but at the end of the year, it had increased $2,000, okay? So forget about everything that took place during the year. Let's just concentrate on beginning of the year 15,000, end of the year 17,000. If accounts receivable overall increased $2,000, then did we get cash or not get cash? What happened to that $2,000? Well, indirectly what's happening is we didn't get that cash. It means that we had additional sales on credit. So what happens is if accounts receivable goes up, our cash flow actually is going down because we didn't receive $2,000 in cash. So that's what you would have here under the operating section. You would say a $2,000 increase, or just an increase in accounts receivable, and then you would have a negative $2,000 there. Okay, so you might need to think about that a little bit. All current assets, except for cash, all the other current assets work in the same way. Inventory, uh, prepaids, supplies, all these other current assets. We'll look at the difference between years. If the current asset balance for that current asset went up, then the effect on the cash flow would be decreasing. If the balance went down, then it would be the opposite. The cash flow effect would be an increase here. Now let's concentrate on the current liabilities. And it's the same type of thing. We're gonna look at each current liability from the beginning of the year to the end of the year and see what happened with that account. All right, so the best example here to look at first is accounts payable. So let's say our accounts payable went from 10,000 down to 9,000. So at the beginning of the year it was 10,000, at the end of the year it was 9,000, so it decreased $1,000. Well, accounts payable is what we owe to others, okay? We owe this money to others. So if the balance decreased overall, then that means that cash flow decreased $1,000. Because how did it go from 10,000 to 9,000? We paid off $1,000. Now, obviously during the year, lots of transactions took place, but indirectly, we can just look at the whole thing, looking at it from the ending, from the beginning to the ending, and see what that overall change was and say that's the net effect on cash in the operating section. So if accounts payable went down to 1,000, then we'd say decrease in accounts payable, negative $1,000. And we would do this for all of the current liabilities. So if we had taxes payable, interest payable, you know, any sort of payables, accrued expenses, any of these current liabilities, any change we're going to put on our, our oper in our operating section. So if the if the change was an increase in a current liability, then that would increase cash flow. If it was a decrease in a current liability, then that's a decreasing effect on the cash flow. So you'll notice that assets and liabilities are kind of opposites of each other. Well, this effect is also the opposite. Remember, if a current asset goes up, the effect on cash flow is it goes down. If a current liability goes up, the effect on the cash flow is it goes up. So they work opposite of each other, right? So you might need to just memorize this information, uh, but it does make sense. So if, you're, if you have a strong understanding, if you, if you get your accounting, then this should make perfect sense to you. But I, I, I admit, you need to really think about it because this is a tricky area of accounting, all right? And then like I said previously, the investing section and the financing section would then be the same as it was in our direct method. Then you would take your total changes in these three areas and total them up. In my example, they would total up to the 50,000 because that was the change between the year. Our beginning of the year or ending prior year cash balance was 100,000. So then that gets us in our example, the 150,000 ending balance, which is what we would see in our balance sheet for cash and cash equivalents, all right? Well, class, I hope this video has helped you. I hope it makes sense. Remember to look at the part one video too if you have questions about uh, the investing and financing section because I did explain it in more detail there. And that video is shorter, so make sure you go back there and look at those too. All right, class, good luck, and I hope to see you soon in future videos.